So welcome back and we will uh, immediately proceed to our next lecture so that we can have interaction. Persons 
will become things gone by and as little known in England as leprosy and plague. He's basically saying, look, diphtheria, all these other diseases, we could control them if we studied them, but it has to take the government to support this study. We need help from on high administratively and funding-wise. At present, inquiry has taken us to the very threshold. How long will it be until someone opens the door and bids us enter? Okay, this is germs. Now, what he didn't know was that the same period he was talking, two young men were meeting in Norway, in Bergen, to talk about leprosy. One of them is Carter, and the other is Hansen. Carter had travelled to Norway to meet Hansen's father-in-law, Dan Nielsen, who had written a major book on leprosy, which is in Norwegian, sadly, it's not translated at that time. But it becomes the most important book because the images are very carefully done and you can diagnose leprosy from it. They were, what had happened was, in Norway, there was a huge problem about leprosy, quite an epidemic. And the King of Norway had decided that something had to be done. I think he was persuaded by his medics something had to be done. And so they instituted a series of open buildings, asylums, open asylums for poor people who couldn't afford to separate themselves in their own homes. They appealed to richer people to live separately from their families, to try and segregate themselves within their own homes. But the other people were offered hospitality in these asylums. An asylum is somewhere where you go like a refugee. You go for safety. It isn't a prison. They weren't prisons. They were open house for lepers to come and live. They didn't want them to go out and sneeze or cough or spread any more, germ, any more disease. They knew it was um, contagious, but they did not know how it was spread. They knew it could spread, but they did not know how it could spread. They thought it was uh, um, what we would call genetic, a hereditary disease. But what they were hoping was that the people who were sufferers would willingly take the hospitality and not go on having children. So that it would stop with that generation. That's what they were hoping. It was a, an enlightened, open house, welcoming <coughs> way of trying to control leprosy. Not a punitive one in Norway. And Carter heard about it in Bombay, and so he travelled to Norway to see what was going on there. Um, and there was a feeling of optimism that things were going to change, perhaps, in India at the time. He was hoping so, anyway. Um, the sense that Parks had of being poised on the brink of discovery was absolutely timely. <coughs> Not just because of Carter and Hansen, but because of Birkhoff, Koch, Cohn particularly, and, um, in, in uh, Breslau, in Poland, who was trying to work out the taxonomy of bacteria without knowing necessarily what they did or what they were. But he was working morphologically on trying to catalogue and lay out the patterns try and work out the familiar relationships with bacteria, fun fungi, and so on, all the smaller organisms. He's tremendously important at home. Uh, and it's to him that Koch went shortly afterwards to show him all his work on anthrax. And it was Cohn who supported Koch and really put Koch on the map. Koch did it himself, of course, but he was um, given legitimacy by Cohn at that time. This is all in the next decade or so. Um, so Carter went to see Danielison, and Danielison introduced him to his son-in-law, Hansen, who had a microscope. And he had a good microscope, he had a better microscope than Carter. And when they made friends, Hansen showed Carter what he'd seen, which is the mycobacterium of leprosy down his microscope. Carter knew it was true. He knew straight away it was right because Carter had worked in Mumbai on other things in his own microscope, which wasn't as good as Hansen's, but he knew what he was being shown was correct. He knew straight away. And so these were kindred spirits, these two young men. 
in many ways, not in others, but in many ways. So now, let me get back to see where I am. We all know now, I hope, that leprosy is spread by coughs and diseases and possibly in other ways, we don't know, uh, but progressively mutilating and often mortal if it's untreated. Heaven, heaven knows now we have ways of helping with it, but it's still a filthy, nasty disease for a human being to get, a disgusting disease. Um, in those days there was no treatment at all, hardly, and people had succurating sores, blindness, mutilation of the limbs, um, just a terrible, terrible, terrible disease. Um, and it wasn't curable or mendable until recently, until the 20th century. Um, so at the time they met, people who had leprosy or had signs of leprosy were um, shunned in many places. They, it had happened that way in England and it had stopped leprosy. We didn't have much leprosy at all. I don't think we had any. At least it wasn't admitted we had it. We certainly weren't in the grip of an epidemic like Norway was. We had no need for leprous islands in England at that time. Um, we do have cases now because people travel and catch it uh, and come home with it. Um, and also people immigrate who may have it without knowing, without knowing when they arrive. Um, but the key thing about the Norwegian system was to change public opinion towards it. Not to cause shunning, but to cause a, a change of, of greedy behaviour. That's really what it was for. It was about birth control, to try and stop the next generation from suffering this terrible disease. That's, that was the belief at the time. Now the building I'm showing you now is the... Oh, I've told you about something at Carter in the Royal College. He, remember he studied under this important microscopist, and they were doing really important, tiny, tiny work. <coughs> He knew what a good microscope was, but he didn't have the funds for it at that time, before we got to know all. He got one better later on, very quickly, I think. He came home by an England and got a good one on the way back. And he'd learnt at the college from Rob, Richard Owen, who was one of the superiors in that place. Two persons are generally concerned in every fact. One discovers part, the other completes and corrects. Now, we all know that's true, because if any scientific discovery could be a discovery, but it's not a real discovery until it's confirmed. We all know that. It has to be confirmed before anybody else will believe it. You can put up any theory you like, or any idea or discovery you like, but until it's confirmed as true, it's not accepted as true. And that's what Owen is saying, and this is what Carter notes in his diary. It's very important that you have scientific confirmation. So you, and you need another person to do that. And so Carter, looking down that microscope in Norway, confirmed what was going on. So now you know about Grey's anatomy, you know about his devotion to perfection, to anatomical perfection, and you also know how upset and horrified he would have been to see the cases of leprosy and other diseases in, in India when he got to India. And this was his first reaction when he arrived at Grant Medical College. Sharp fellows, these Parsees and Hindus. He attended a prize giving at Grant, and this he wrote in his diary. So you can see straight away, he's not a racist person at all. He's a generous person, and he respects Indian intelligence <laughs> in Mumbai, which I think is fantastic. I think there would be other visitors who weren't so kind. Uh, this, these photographs come from a modern paper by Sharma, and we'll come to it in a second. And these show you a modern case of uh, what was then known as Madura foot. Uh, Carter, had, when he, within a year of arrival of, uh, into, in, in Bombay, had discovered that this disease is caused by a fungus. And he named it mycetoma, a, a, a lump made from mycelia, a, a fungal tumour. Fungal tumor. And he was the first person in the world to see the fungus and to recognize it for what it was. And I think it's partly because of the training under Quackett um, at the Ross Royal College, but also he visited the um, Chelsea Physic Garden in London, where there were two, there used to be two very beautiful trees. There's an old tree showing these two beautiful cedars growing 
in the garden. And when he visited, one of them had been cut down because it was dead. And he examined the, the, the inside of the tree and realized that a fungus had felled that noble tree. And he was very interested in what kind of fungus it might have been. So he, and he was trained at the, at the Royal College into cutting edge microscopy at that time. So he knew about cultivating fungi, cultivating uh, bacterial fungi. And so he was very interested by this mycetoma fungus and he was trying to grow it on potato, on rice flour. They, there was no, <laughs> the petri dish did not exist at this date. There's no agar gel, okay? There's none of that stuff, it doesn't exist. So people are trying on other materials to try and cultivate. This is absolutely new microbiology. And he brings it from London to Bombay and he tries it on this disease. And he then um, publishes it in the Proceedings of the Medical and Physical Society of Bombay, which is a fantastic small society which has such a good publication. You all ought to know about it if you don't already. Historically, it's the most important organisation for medicine in Bombay at that time. And there should be a society now for Bombay, I think. Where is it gone? It's lost. It's closed down. It doesn't have a headquarters. It used to meet in the JJ, in the, the Grand Hospital Library, or in the University College, the University Library here in Mumbai. And somehow it's got lost. The doctors have stopped meeting one another and discussing new scientific discoveries. Or as they're still humanities, but they have the science. Where's the science in Mumbai? Do you have societies now? Where's that society gone? I'm so sorry to hear that it's disappeared. Because these publications are fantastic. The, uh, uh, Carter stuff alone, that's all I've looked at, but I've picked up there's other stuff. There's a very vibrant culture of discussion within Mumbai medicine. And, they, and it's not just surgeons, it's surgeons, physicians, and pharmacy people all mixing together. It's a very interesting organisation. It's a pity, it's a real pity it's not there anymore. So he publishes in 1860 and 61 and 62 in the proceedings details of mycetoma. And it's, he writes a letter to the Lancet in 1870 exactly about it, defending his description of the, of the um, my, mycelium that he's discovered. Um, and he's reporting in 1872, he goes back to London and he reports at the Pathological Society of London and presents um, evidence of it. He brings back a, um, an infected foot which has been made into a specimen and he shows the details of this terrible disease. The sad thing for him is he had sent one in 1860 but it got lost somewhere en route. <laughs> so they missed doing the work in London. And he's asking for help amongst mycologists in England to try and identify what the mycelium is, what it's made from, what, what organism it is. I think he also sends it to Coke in the end as well. Um, and he also shows drawings of skin eruptions, early diagnosis, for early diagnosis of leprosy. This is his major textbook on mycetoma. It's a really beautiful book, fantastic book, full of illustrations and careful thought about what mycetoma is, the fungus disease of India. And this came out in 1874. It's a big book, it's about this size. Big, beautiful, fine book. And there's a copy in the JJ Library, but unfortunately I wasn't able to see it when I visited the library. But there is one there. I hope you might have one in this institution, but I don't know what it is. Um, and it's dedicated to Godfrey, who was a, a doctor who described the swelling of the foot. Balinjal, who I haven't managed to track down what he did, been attributed to his grandfather, and it's not his grandfather, it's Balinjal who was here in Bombay, um, and other pioneers in research, and that means all of you, okay, he's dedicating it to pioneers in research, and that's potentially everyone in this room who's engaged in medicine, because you're all researchers, you're all working with diseases and complaints of all kinds, where whatever job you've got, and you're all potentially the scientific discoverer of something. That's my view. <laughs> okay, and he says, profit for the consideration of workers in India at the present day. And that's his time, but I think it's our present day too. Um, and he says, it was hardly to be anticipated that so singular a complaint as mycetoma should be at once unanimously recognized. 
And since the morbid growth is concerned with a class of organisms whose manifold relations, many-fold relations, are matters are yet matters of controversy, because people hadn't worked out fungi at all. These were organisms that hadn't really been investigated or explored properly. We have names for them, but they didn't. They were just developing at the time. Um, manifold relations are yet a, a matter of controversy. It becomes even less likely that all the suggestions which I have made, which I have thought fit to put forth, will prove acceptable. <coughs> Nevertheless, I must too here abide until some clearer light is from other quarters afforded. He's basically saying, I've done what I can. Other people will have to take it forward. And other people have. I'm so pleased to say, pleased to say. Does the difference depend upon inoculation at a different stage of development of the entophyte? Can botanists tell us under what circumstances fungi and bacteria become interchangeable? It's actually a mycobacteria. It's, it's in between the two. And he's working on that very, very narrow boundary between mycology and bacteriology. It's a very interesting area. And on the adoption of my view, may not surgeons be able to prevent the occurrence of mycetoma in much infested localities? Because he's aware it's more common in some parts of the locality. He's working in what was called the Bombay Presidency. So it's, it's just the Bombay area, around Bombay, and I think a large part of Maharashtra. You'll, be, you'll know better than I where the boundary was. But he knows it's more common in certain areas mostly farming areas and it's mostly farmers who get it because they're working in the fields in bare feet and maybe they get a, a thorn or some other uh, um, injury and in goes the infective body so he's hoping could it, could it be prevented and um, these are his own pictures showing the outer the gross anatomy of the mycetoma, the mycetoma foot and you know, if it travels up, you, all you can do is, is amputate, and if it gets into the trunk, you're finished really, it's the end. And this is what happens to the bone, and this, these are the chambers that it creates inside the foot. How it travels, it, it's regardless of bone, it just travels its own way. It's quite a merciless organism. And these are his drawings of the details that he's seeing in his microscope. This is the less good microscope, I think. It could possibly be the better one, I'm not quite sure. 1874, yes, it could be the better one that he's using in this case. But you can see the detail of the, the fruiting bodies and so on. He's trying to work out what is this organism. There seems to be a black, organ, a black fruiting body which comes out of the holes in the feet. And there seems to also be a red fungus that grows. And he doesn't know if this is two organisms or different phases of the same one. And there's also little white rice-like um, uh, bodies that, that you find under section. And he doesn't know what they are. He's trying to grow it and find out what they are. He thinks it may fruit only at certain times of year. He's, he's pondering and exploring all kinds of possibilities about this organism. He doesn't quite get there, but he does his very best. This is it growing on agar now, and it's red, you can see. And it has, I think that's shadow, but I'm not sure. I don't, I've not seen a picture, a modern picture of the black grains. Local people in the farming area said it was caused by ants. They thought the grains were the ant droppings. And the ants had made all the, like an ant tail of the foot. Which is a very good explanation, actually. You could see why they would think that. But it's not the case. Um, and the photographs that I showed earlier on come from this wonderful paper by Sharma. Sharma Sharma, so that's husband and wife, I think, and others, Department of Medicine in New York. But they've done their work here, and they're, I think they're from here. And actually, I tried to ask them for permission to show you this, and my email came back, so I think they've already moved on from there. But this is a wonderful paper, case report, non-invasive management of Madura foot with oral posaconazole and sacrofloxacin. acid. Yes, so it shows you, they're not actually calling it mycetoma, they're calling it Madura foot. And there's some argument about that because Madura is an island somewhere else where they don't have this complaint. And the re 
real name is from Madura I, A-I, Madura I, which is near a home. So that's not technically correct, Madura Foot. I don't know why they don't call it Mycetoma. There's an argument, some people call it new Mycetoma, and I don't know what special difference that makes. But Mycetoma is part of coinage. And they cured it in this gentleman with this terrible foot by giving antifungals. And it's just a, a dream. Carter would be so happy to see this. He'd be over the moon. It isn't surgery that mends it, it's pharmacology. Blessed thing. So now this is Carter in 1862. He says, being a willing horse and well worked. This is his, he worked very, very hard and he loves doing the work. This is a list of all his publications. He arrives in 1858 and he retires in 1888, so that's 30 years. He works on mycetoma, elephantiasis, leprosy, intestinal lesions, bone structures, calculi, boutons, that's various boils, terrible infected boils, pellagra, which he did not know was a, a nutritional disease. He was looking to see what on earth caused pellagra and didn't find it. Spirillum fever, which we now call relapsing fever. Uh, it was also known as famine fever, I'll come to that in a bit. <coughs> Tuberculosis, sura, which is a, a terrible disease of horses, kills horses, flays them, uh, uh, flattens them very quickly, a horrible disease, a trypanosome. Um, malaria and other fevers. So he's writing on all those things. The dates show you the, the number of, um, the, of main publications. There are others that should be here, but I couldn't fit them all on. Leprosy, you can see, is the main one. That's the third one from the top in green. If you can't read the words at the very back. Okay. Um, part of the reason he started on leprosy was to try and differentiate mycetoma, le uh, elephantiasis, and leprosy. Partly because people were being treated as lepers when they only had mycetoma. They were being shunned because they had mycetoma or because they had elephantiasis. And he was saying, hang on a minute, these look different complaints to me. Let's have a look. Let's see if we can do the differential diagnosis by, you know, looking at the symptoms and trying to show how they differ, not how similar they are. And so that's partly what, what motivated him. He was trying to stop people shunning someone with mycetoma or elephantiasis. Not to make them do it to, leprosy, to people with leprosy, but to say, look, this person hasn't got leprosy. Um, so he, these are all his publications. And you can see for leprosy, he starts, the first one is 62, and it goes on till 1887, till he, till, almost till he retires. That's the most uh, committed part of his work is to leprosy. But you can see he's a deeply committed publishing medic. His work on leprosy before he went to Norway, sorry, you won't be able to read that at the back, is um, on leprosy. 1862, Symptoms and Morbid Anatomy of Leprosy in the Bombay Medical and Physical Journal. 1862, again, on the condition of the nerve trunks in anaesthetic leprosy. He was showing the brown matter in the nerve, um, the nerve sheets, how leprosy gives you the lack of feeling in your fingers and why, that, why you get damaged. Again, nerves in lepra anaesthetica in the Pathological Society of London in absentia, so he sent that paper. Uh, uh, sorry, the next the previous one was that the same. 1872, report on the prevalence and character of leprosy in the Bombay Presidency based on official returns. Now that he was trying to do a statistical analysis and a population analysis of the spread and, and distribution of leprosy in this area, in the Bombay Presidency. And that's published here in a special press called the Education Society Press, which was in Bicolor. And quite a lot of his stuff is printed in the colour. It's part of Indian history, and he should not just be written out. <laughs> he should not be written out just because he's a Britisher, this man. He's a goodie. Um, and this is the, the statistical one, uh, printed in... There you see, you can see the address at the bottom, Education Societies Press at the colour. They were, treat, they were teaching typography and things in that building. So they were using... they were teaching how to print. On, on important documents. Um, this one was already printed in the uh, Medical and Physical Society, so this is a reprint. This is the, the harbour in 
um, burger where he goes in Norway. And I think he'd be fairly home at home with this because of Bombay. Bombay Harbour must have looked pretty much like this at the time with, with Indian ships. And also Scarborough, where he was from, where he was brought, brought up, that was also a, a sailing ship harbour. So I think he felt quite at home in Norway, although it would have been colder than England, I would have thought. Um, and this is the young Hansen, as he would have been when uh, Carter met him, more or less. So a young, handsome young man doing microscopical work like Carter. He wasn't believed. Hansen was not believed. His father-in-law, Dan Ellison, who had done all the work on leprosy, did not believe it was a bacterial disease. He just didn't accept it. He thought it was hereditary. He wouldn't accept that these brown things could cause this disease. He didn't believe it. But when Carter looked at it, because he'd worked on the nerve, on the sheaths of the nerves and seen the, the, the brown matter, he knew the brown matter was important. He just couldn't see the, the, uh, the mycobacteria in there. He couldn't see the causative organism because his lenses weren't good enough when he was in India, but in, in, in Bergen he could see, he could see straight away. That's why he believed Hansen straight away. <clears throat> this is the le leprosy um, asylum in Bergen, as it is today, it's now a museum of leprosy, <coughs> and it's empty, it's, you walk through the echoing walls. Here's the interior. And you can see they were very closely involved with hygiene that place. They didn't know how it was caused or spread. They thought it was hereditary, but the sense of still and cleanliness is different from what you would expect in a, in a death colony or something elsewhere. It's a different thing. It's, it's got a stillness to it, which is extraordinary. Um, when we were there, we went to visit. It was absolutely lovely. We met a young couple getting married in the chapel in the Leprosy Museum. It was really delightful. Lovely place. Lovely, lovely place. Uh, so now 1874, when he comes back to Bombay, he comes via London and he must have got a better lens for his microscope or even a better microscope. Of course, I don't have that knowledge. I haven't got receipts or anything to prove that. But when he gets back, he can see the microbacteria. He can see the cause of leprosy in the brown matter. He writes, report on leprosy and leper asylums in Norway with references to India. And that's published in London by the India office. And then he publishes his major book on leprosy and elephantiasis. And that's published by Her Majesty's Stationery Office in London. So this is all being sent from Bombay to be printed and published in London. And he publishes Nisotoma the same year. So this 1874 is a miraculous year. It's a, an annus mirabilis, as they say. This is the Norway book and, and, and its uh, contents. Summary, numbers, climate, sex, age, caste, he's comparing all kinds of things. Um, when they married, whether they were single or, or married, age of death, and so on and so forth. A tremendously detailed work. Um, and here's a general view of the le leprosy uh, sanctuary in, in Bergen. Um, then the following year, he, I think it's the following year, he does, does a very interesting study in Katiawa. Now, how do I pronounce it? Okay, okay. You know, you know where I mean. Um, and it's this little, it's a, well, it's not little, it's a, it's a peninsula north of Bombay, north of Mumbai now, it always was. And you can see he, he does this special job for the chiefs of Katiawa, who were the local um, bosses of that whole area under the British. They funded his work. I, I just something I wanted to show you. So he goes and surveys on foot himself all the lepers that he can find in that part of the countryside to see how widespread it really is. Because he doesn't trust the figures that are given to him in the leper census. He tries to look at what caste they're in and if there's a leper caste if they all have it. And if there are people with leprosy in other castes. He's trying to work out what really exists on the ground. Trying to map it. And he writes a report about that. And uh, the following, when he compares Norway and, and Mumbai, he uses the same colour coding for um, showing whether infection affected Norway and also how strong it is in the Bombay coastal area. But, but the important difference is that the white area in Norway shows no cases, whereas the white area beyond Bombay Nobody knew what 
was on the other side. Nobody knew how much, what the prevalence was beyond the boundary of the Bombay Presidency. Nobody had done that work at that time. He'd only looked at Bombay, the Bombay Presidency. So he's showing a small sample, probably, whereas they're showing a whole sample. But I love the colouring. I think it's like brown matter. <laughs> I think he's showing inflammation, you know, in a kind of pictorial way. It's very touchy. And he also compares Norway with what he had witnessed on his journeys investigating leprosy in, in India. The, the difference in care in Norway. Of course, the problem in India was much larger, I think, figure in terms of numbers, population. But even so, he was urging the Indian uh, rulers and the British, please, to do something to help leprosy, to help le le people with leprosy in this country. And he was comparing the two. The top one formed of bundles of straw laid upon a, upon a frame of poles out in the fields, and the leper's hut at Mehla, near Datta. He, he talks about these cases in the only in Norway practical measures are in full force, while in India all has yet to be done, he says in 1874. In Norway, soon after the establishment of asylums, the number of new cases began to fall. The death rate now far exceeds the birth rate of our children. Can you not? Oh, I'm so sorry. Have you heard me? Yes. yes. Oh, good. In Norway, soon after the establishment of asylums, the number of new cases began to fall. The death rate now far exceeds the birth rate. On this calculation, one might learn to hopefully anticipate the extinction of the malady. And he's right, it's extinct in Norway, except for travellers, it's extinct. There's no indigenous leprosy in Norway anymore. Um, Footnote in his report, in this same report, 1874, he says, I take this opportunity of alluding very briefly to the latest investigations which I have become, with which I have become acquainted from their great interest and value. Dr. G. A. Hansen of Bergen is engaged in a series of inquiries which cannot but throw much light upon the origin and nature of leprosy. These point to the parasitic origin of the disease. By Dr. Hansen's kindness, I have myself seen the minute organisms, a species of bacterium, he wasn't aware of this mycobacterium at that stage, which are present in living leprous matter, taken from the interior of a leprous tubercle. That's 1874. So this is the first news in English that leprosy may be contagious, that it's caused by bacteria, that it's not genetic, it's not hereditary. Um, and in, in this book, the Leprosy and Elephantiasis book, which is chiefly devoted to differentiating the two diseases and presenting them for diagnosis purposes, he has an appendix translating the whole of Hansen's report into English, so it's available to English readers across the world. Anyone who could read English could read this, um, his report of the, of, the, of the bacillus in English. And these are Carter's own drawings. There's drawings in here dated 1862, so I know he's working on it from the 1860s, from the elephantiasis period, from the uh, mycetoma period onwards. Okay, these are, he's showing the, the telltale signs of it. And on white and brown skins. He's, he's, um, he's, he doesn't differentiate, he's saying this disease affects everybody, it's a disease. And this is quite a famous image, I think, of the brown matter as it, as it affects, it swells the nerves. And this is what it does to the bones and so on. And he's trying to look at the organism itself, he's doing, showing you down the microscope what he can see. So now he then does um, uh, a controlled trial at the JJ in the leprosy ward, which is now the boys' common room at JJ. Um, 
he's got good Indian assistance in the ward. It's, it was actually called the incurable ward. It should have been for patients with cancer and other incurable diseases, as well as leprosy. But there were so many people with leprosy, they filled out the whole ward, so it became a leprosy ward. And they did these clinical trials using local um, uh, remedies. So they were comparing county oil and all these other things. Can you read this? The waku oil, groundnut oil, cashew nut oil, liquor lighter, I don't know what that is. Gurgen oil, carbolic acid, cod liver oil, and chalmogra oil. And it gives you down the table, it says a useful aid, utility doubtful, utility not apparent, <laughs> utility local and temporary. So it did help a bit, but only locally. Not specifically useful, utility not apparent, utility not established, that's carbolic acid. Cod liver oil was of no benefit. Chalmuga oil of decided utility in leprosy, a great gain. So this is a controlled trial using this on different patients to see what the results were and whether you could double up and check whether you could reuse on other patients and see if there was beneficial effects. And he says, prolonged use, administered outwardly and inwardly, this is Chalmugra oil, not universally beneficial, but decidedly and moderately so in some cases. Occasionally, it prompts spontaneous periods of recovery. So he's taken a local, he's not snobbish about local pharmacy, he's interested in it. He wants to know if it really works, just like he would do in London. Does this really work? Could it help? And he's found something, he's proved by doing this trial with his assistants, his Indian assistants, they prove that this works to some extent, a limited extent, but it works. A good, with a good and sufficient diet, that's part of it, with personal cleanliness and suitable hygiene, that's another part, and these were as well attended to. So he's feeding them up, he's treating them well, he's keeping them clean on the ward. There's a regime in force in that leprosy ward. He knows that it has to be clean, clean, like in Norway. He knows how to do it. But in Norway, they don't know about child oil. So he's doing that work here. Then his work is completely disrupted in 1876 to 8. There's the most desperate famine in India, you probably know, in that period. Absolutely desperate. Five million people die in that famine. And with it comes a terrible fever epidemic, which is Borrelia, a Borrelia uh, relapsing fever, carried by ticks and body lice. What happens is thousands and thousands of people arrive in Bombay from the countryside, districts because they're starving, and they think there may be work here, they may be able to survive in Bombay when they can't live in, they just die in the fields if they stayed there. So they're all arriving, they move into the slums, the slums are overcrowded, they're sleeping on the beaches, they're sleeping all along Marine Drive, they're on the beach of the bay, they're everywhere. People all sleeping out on the street. I mean, you see people sleeping on the street here, but then it was thousands and thousands and thousands of them in a much smaller city. And of course it was perfect feeding ground for these creatures jumping from body to body. And um, he found it among starving migrants, they were dying like flies in these sleeping grounds. Um, and he found this very telltale, um, double, can, I don't know if you can see that from the back. It's a graph of a temperature chart. Sorry. <laughs> and it shows the double relapsing fever. It, it, you think you're better, you think you're better, and bang, it comes back. It's a horrible, horrible disease, and lots of people died then. But they survived, if they survived this, a lot more died then, because they were already weaker. So it was a killer, real killer. It's the same disease, it's the same disease that killed people in the Irish potato famine. It's a filthy disease. It was also known as famine fever. Relapsing, relapsing fever is the more modern now. He called it spirillin fever because he discovered the organism that caused it here in Bombay. Okay, um, he says the peculiar organism, this is in his published book, he discovered it himself alone in, Mom in Bombay amongst these people. 
He discovered it alone. But what he didn't know was that a man called Ogemeyer had already discovered it in Berlin when there was a terrible famine in Berlin amongst very poor people. They had, they had this disease. And Obermeyer had isolated it. He was a pupil of Virchow. Obermeyer had isolated it and shown it to Cohn, and it had already been named. But Carter did not know that over here. He discovered it alone and later discovered that it had been found before. So Carter confirmed this organism caused this disease in India, and by doing so, he proved this was a global disease, not confined to Europe. It's, it's a world disease. Like leprosy, it's a world disease. So he's a globalist, internationalist in disease terms. Um, the peculiar organism known as Spirillum febris recurrentis of Cohn, Cohn named it, has been satisfactorily demonstrated in the blood of fever victims in Bombay. And it was from this double chart that he diagnosed it, he realized it was what other people had called um, relapsing uh, no, famine fever, which had this double peak, but they didn't know about the organism. Um, and he writes, he, he publishes, he speaks at public meetings in Britain and in India, and he, he presents it in the, um, this is the Royal Medical and Chirurgical Society in London. Um, he presents the findings. He thinks it may be a new malady in India, Spirilla in the blood at fever height, not checked by quinine. Now, if it was checked by quinine, it would be malaria. Quinine had no effect on it. Not checked by quinine, an identical profile to relaxing fever in European epidemics. He had examined 900 cases, and about half of them had been affected with this um, organism. Very high death rate, 18% death rate amongst the people he looked after. The organism had been confirmed by Ferdinand Cohn, his organism, and had been identified as the one in Europe. He publicly thanked three doc doctors, all Indian doctors, at the JJ Hospital in his, in his uh, book, Spirilla. Spirilla. He shows the characteristic um, temperature charts, and in 1879 he discovered an animal model for it, and it's the first time that had ever been done. Um, after Koch. Koch had done it for uh, anthrax, but Carter did it for spirillum fever, what he called spirillum fever. Uh, in 1879, he created a pure culture of the organism. He transmitted it from humans to monkeys and from monkey to monkey. This is completely new work. Nobody had done this in the world before. Um, so he was the first in the world to do this successfully for any human disease after Koch himself. And I don't think he's ever had the credit for that. Uh, in 1883, he showed TB. He confirmed Koch TB was the same organism in Bombay as it is in Europe. And he showed it next to leprosy and showed how similar the organisms are at the Bombay uh, Medical and Physical Society. So they were all able to see how similar these organisms are and how different their, their um, effects on the human body but how fatal they are, how dreadful and shocking and terrible they both are. And he dates it uh, Bombay, June 1883. Published later, but he dates it. Um, in 1884, Koch had found cholera in Calcutta, and I think confirmed it here, I'm not quite certain of that, but he certainly found it in Calcutta. And the British were very angry with it. Uh, because they didn't like a German coming to India, to Calcutta, which was the seat of government then, the head of the IMS, and discovering that organism and saying that's what it was. Nobody wanted to believe it. Um, but Carter confirms it's the same organism in Bombay. Um, and he shows it at the Bombay Medical and Physical Society. Three microscopes were set up to show the common bacillus. Samples being obtained from the evacuations of local Bombay patients suffering from cholera. Koch was congratulated by the whole society on his discovery, and so was Carter. Dr. Carter said he considered these organisms more in the nature of a vibrio than a bacillus, but time would tell. And actually, Carter was correct. It is a vibrio. It's now known to be a vibrio. It's called a vibrio anyway, not a bacillus. So Carter was very prescient on that score. He was right. 
Um, in the 1880s, too, he published two further memoranda on leprosy, leprosy statistics in Norway from figures supplied to him by Hansen, showing a marked decline in new cases and a continued drop in absolute numbers of people afflicted with leprosy in Norway. So he's showing the continuing success of that public health intervention in Norway. And he's trying to get the British and the Indian um, governments underneath them please to do something. But it's like singing in the wind. It's no good. It won't work. There's no attention to pay. He talks, he says, the diminution of new cases goes pari passu, meaning parallel, parallel, with the lessening numbers of home dwelling sick. In Norway, he says. He wants it to happen here. And then he publishes a small piece showing that mycetoma, it's called Note on the Apparent Similarity between Mycetoma and Actinomyces. And nowadays, a lot of mycetoma has been recognized as being caused by Actinomyces. So he's very prescient in that respect. He's differentiating between different organisms. Then in 1888, there's the most wonderful piece of work, which I just I've got my own copy I've managed to get on eight books very cheaply, and I adore it. This is malaria, 1888. It's his last year in Bombay. He leaves Bombay that year to return to England. He's the first investigator in India to prove that malaria, that the malaria organism that Lavaron found in Algeria and that others have found elsewhere, also it causes malaria in India. Didn't know the cause of the transmission root at all, but he's looking at the organism. Um, and he's amongst the first in the world to confirm Lavaron, and amongst those, he's the only one who did it without being shown by an initiate. So all the other people who had seen what Lavaron saw had been shown by Lavaron, or they were people who had been shown by those people. They were in a chain directly to Lavaron, whereas Carter hadn't been shown by anybody. He'd seen a description by William Osler in the British Medical Journal, and from that description, he'd gone back to look, and he found it on his own in Bombay. And the drawings are breathtaking. His, his description is wonderful, absolutely beautiful description in this piece. And if you see it's um, reprinted, this one is reprinted from the Scientific Memoirs by Medical Officers of the Army of India, Part 3. It's a very obscure publication. Printed by the Superintendent of Government Printing in Calcutta. So that was a, there was a delay. But he confirmed it in the spring, I think, of, um, of 1888. And you can see these drawings. They're blown up on the poster publicising this lecture. So you can see them in large. I wanted to put a microscope, uh, um, an e-microscope, over these images to show you the detail. It, they're rather uh, blurred on this slide, and I please I apologise to you for that. But the detail of them is absolutely miraculous. He's trying to describe how these curious things behave. It's like looking at the moon's surface and finding something waddling about on the moon, you know, and trying to think what kind of organism is this. Because the malaria organism is such a peculiar thing, the way it behaves, the, 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 the whole um, morphology and the multiple appearances of it in the blood, and it's the way it invades bits of the blood, the way it behaves, the way the blood corpuscles devour it, all the details are here. So he's verging on the um, immune system, he's on the edge of a lot of things here, and of course he's also admiring of Metchnikov, who he knows exists and has written. So there's Metchnikov admires Carter too. There's, there's Lavaron admires him, Metchnikov admires him, Cohn admires him. People around the world who matter admire Carter's work in Mumbai, in, in Bombay. It's a magnificent piece of work. Tiny little thing, a few pages, but it's, it's gold dust, absolute gold dust, this piece of work. And I'm pleased to see that this portrait, which had been disappeared for a long time, I could only find a very bad photograph in London and everyone I asked here had no idea where it was, has appeared in the library at the JJ, at the Grant Medical College, and the librarian has put some flowers in front from when I was visiting. It was out on show and um, there were flowers 
and I was able to sprinkle petals for him the day before yesterday. Um, but I want to find, I don't know how, I need somebody wealthy. Please, does anybody know anyone wealthy? Please, somebody in this room must have a contact who would pay for this to be properly renovated. Because this portrait, it's in the wrong frame for a start. It's decomposing from the back. It doesn't fit the frame. Round the edge, the paint has all come away from the canvas. And it's the only portrait we have from Carter in his final year in Bombay when he was doing the malaria work. It's beautiful. He's leaning on a pile of his own books, which are not actually documentary versions, because the, the artist, who's an Indian artist, I don't know who it is, I'd like to know, and I hope it's painted on the back of the canvas, um, or in the bottom margin, it might survive, I don't know. He's, he had to fit the words of he or she, it might be a lady artist, I don't know, um, had to fit the name of the books on the spine, so made the spines big enough for the words to fit. Mycetoma, spirilla, you know, they're a lot worse. So the books are wider than they really are in real life. But they are there. Leprosy, spirilla, and mycetoma are there. And there is also some smaller ones, which I think might be the Bombay medical and physical um, papers. I don't know what they are. It'd be wonderful to have it cleaned and renovated and back in a place on a wall where it can be safe and not slip. Uh, you know, I'm worried about this portrait. It's a fantastic thing. It's, a, it's an Indian portrait of a man who was devoted to India, who was devoted to Bombay, devoted to JJ, and devoted to Bond Medical College, and devoted to the patients in the hospitals, to let the poor lepers and the poor people with mycetoma, devoted to the Indian sick. <coughs> and this portrait should be renovated, it should be honoured, because he honoured India with his life. Because when he, went, when he left India, he married at 60 something, he met a young woman, they married, and they had a little family, a little boy, a little girl, and when the girl was two, Carter died of TB, which I think he picked up when he was studying it. So he died at 65, just before his 66th birthday in Scarborough, and he buried in Scarborough, and the children were still tiny. The son died within living memory, and I have corresponded with a granddaughter, or a great-granddaughter, who gave me this photo. And there they are, the mother, the father, the part of the father, his wife, and the little boy on the esplanade in Scarborough. They must have got a, a nice photographer on the seafront in Scarborough, using his Sunday best. I think he has little bumps on his face which might be leprosy on the street. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But he's buried in Scarborough. So now, after Carter left India in 1889, he left in 1888, okay? 1889, Father Damien died in Molokai, which was a, an island off Hawaii, which was a separate place, uninhabited island, devoted to le leprosy. All the lepers in Hawaii were sent there. It was a kind of penal colony, really, for, and they had no money, no care, nothing. Uh, they were just dumped there. <coughs> and Father Damien was a Catholic priest who thought that wasn't right, so he went himself on his own with all the blessing of the Catholic Church to, to minister to these lepers on Molokai. And he died in 1889 of leprosy. He didn't have leprosy when he went there. Nobody said that he was a leper. He went out of the kindness of his heart and love of the patients and love of God. But he died of leprosy. And this case came to public notice because there was a, a letter published by two Protestant uh, ministers, one writing to the other about Father Damien, saying that they think he caught it sexually, that he was sexually uh, profligate on the island. And Robert Louis Stevenson read, Robert Louis Stevenson, the English writer, read these letters published, this letter that was published, and he was ashamed of these men for discussing it, and ashamed for them that it was published, absolutely ashamed. And he wrote a, a piece in defense of Father Damien, which, if you haven't read it, you must look on the internet and find it and read it. Because it comes from Robert Louis Stevenson's heart, deep, deep in his heart. He's as angry as hell. He's really angry that anyone should cast doubt on Father Damien and cast that kind of aspersion on Father Damien. Robert Louis 
Henry Stevenson had been there and had seen the work on the island, he had seen Father Damien's work amongst the lepers, and he was absolutely ashamed of these two men for mentioning anything against Father Damien. Even if they thought it, they shouldn't have written it. Even if they thought it, which is disreputable, they shouldn't have written it. Father Damien is now a saint in the Catholic Church, and rightly so in my view. You have to honour ancestors who do things like that. Um, but this eulogy was published, and because it was by Robert Louis Stevenson, it went everywhere. It was really an angry piece, and he doesn't normally write in an angry way. He's the kindest, sweetest man. And this, his sweetness came out as upset, and it's brilliantly written. It's a fantastic piece of work. But it spread news, that's the thing, it spread the news that leprosy is not hereditary, that it's contagious. Father Damien caught it from his, from his fellow inhabitants at, at Monaco. <clears throat> and public opinion got changed. Archdeacon Wright, who's um, quite a strong imperialist, wrote a book called Leprosy and Imperial Danger. He was worried that white people would catch it. Uh, and the, case, the contagion doubters were hushed, not just in leprosy, but in the people who were anti-germ theory elsewhere. They were suddenly confronted with a kind of mass movement of things, of people who were thinking, hang on, contagion's true. It's germs, it's germs. Anyone can get it, contagion is true. And if that's so for leprosy, it's so for other diseases. So it, the, the humanity, the humanities, medicine isn't the only way news spreads. It's also the humanities too, okay? And Robert Louis Stevenson was the best ambassador for contagion theory, for germ theory, that had ever been. And, and um, so the contagion doubters were hushed. Pity and revulsion for these poor people who were infected raised money quickly, loads of money. Christian, missions, Christian missionaries mobilized, both Catholic and Protestant. And in 1897, the year Carter died, was the first International Leprosy Congress. Okay? He died before it even happened. He was invited to go and quit because he was dying. So this is, this is not his responsibility. Archdeacon Wright is not his responsibility. The whole imperial business is not Carter's responsibility at all. He wasn't an imperialist. The, the imperialist leprosy, um, uh, hoo-ha, clamour, uh, sumil, and shubia call it, uh, the post damian segregationist Glamour, which happened after Damien, was not from Carter. It's a completely different tone of voice. It, I don't recognise it. Having read all Carter's stuff, I don't recognise this voice. It's a different tone of voice, more punitive and not nice. And I, and I object to it too. And I think Carter would. Um, and I just want to say, 1902, Nobel Prize giving. Ronald Ross, who had seen where Carter, this, the bad the poor facilities he'd had here to do all his scientific work. He was asked to work in the same premises and refused to do so. He says, I beg to thank you, this is the Swedish Nobel banquet in front of him, I beg to thank you for the very great honour you have done me, this Ronald Ross saying, I cannot help comparing the present moment with that when seven years ago I commenced the researches for which you have today given me such honour. I cannot help remembering the dingy little military hospital, the old cracked microscope, he was in the same boat, the old cracked microscope and the medicine bottles which constituted all the laboratory and apparatus which I possessed for the purpose of, attack, for the purpose of attacking one of the most redoubtable of scientific problems. That's the transmission of malaria. And he goes on. He first honours Laveron, which is the first person to describe the malaria organism, who more than 20 years ago discovered the cause of malaria and created a new branch of science. And those who had consolidated Lavarov's discovery, among whom he names Golgi, you know Golgi, uh, the neurologist in, in Italy, he also worked on malaria in Italy, Koch in Germany, Manson in England, Henry van der Carter of Bombay. Now he's up there with those men Okay, he's up there in Ross's estimation, and he has to be up there with us, with our estimation too. He has to be 
honoured in Mumbai, Mumbai, not just with a CD old portrait, not with dust, not with fungi on the, on the back of the canvas. He should be properly honoured here. He's a good man. Thank you very much. Your lecture was brilliant. 
And I wonder whether you've been to India before. No. I have. I've wanted to for years, for years. <coughs> but I've been invited elsewhere to speak and lecture. I don't earn a lot of money, as you can hear. Thank you. So it's not always easy. You have been to DJ campus. Okay. Uh, any idea where uh, Carter stayed there? Yes. Which building? Which building? He was in the old, the old Grant Medical College building. Yeah, he did. But there. And many... the mortuary in front. There's a little, a beautiful little building in front, near the girls' common room. The boys' common room. No, the, the girls' common room. Girls' common room. Shubhya. Yeah. You know about all this, don't you? Come on. Yes. Uh, there's a little uh, structure there. Opposite uh, uh, this uh, girls' common room, ladies' common room, yes. the small one. Today it's. I see. Today it's used as a storeroom, right. but in a map which I have of the campus of the Grant Medical College from 1894, okay. it says PM, that means post That's what I heard. Yeah. And since, and there's a label there, it says 1875. Okay. So almost certainly the spirillum fever, famine fever, okay. post mortems yeah. were done there. And he says that. Uh, I, uh, the work was done at GT Hospital because he was the superintendent at GT Hospital. Okay. And at GT. Your PM room, I know that. Because there is also a PM room. But I didn't know that the doctor was staying there. No, he didn't stay there. Okay then. There were post mortems, but not there. Oh, post mortem. Well, where he stayed, initially, uh, he stayed at the Baikala Club. Okay. Now, if you go to the Baikala Bridge, there is the Khada Parsi. Right, right. And then there is the municipal fire brigade. Right, by the way. Yes. Yeah. And if you go down Santley Street a bit, mm -hmm. there, there was a very famous British hostel, uh, what do you call it, club, called the Baikala Club. Okay. And it served. Not the WMC. No, no, no. This was called Reserve the Baikala Bank Club. Waters. Sorry? Now, Reserve Bank Quarters. Where the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and then there used to be the race course there. Bombay race course was there. Okay. Near the Baikala Club. Okay. And later, when he became principal, okay. I have seen in a Times of India street directory okay. that he stayed at the Walton's Hotel, which is the broken down structure which collapsed almost next to the university. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, Tata went and the uh, Air Force and they supposed to be. Yeah, supposed okay. to be. So, Baikala Club. Okay. And then. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Would you like to say something about how he was uh, how he was sort of suppressed yes. by the sanitarians in Bombay, yes. in India? You know. you know more than me. I know that they sent. Uh, Lewis and Cunningham, that's right, to put down his work. Yes. They re-examined Mycetoma and denied it. Yes. <clears throat> they re-examined other things and tried to deny it, but they're wrong. <laughs> and he was denied. Uh, uh, many of these people, after retirement, were made, uh, uh, you know, surgeon to the queen. Yes. So that they could get an enhanced uh, pension. But Carter was denied that. Uh, he only retired as a brigade surgeon, but it's after his retirement that his fellow officers complained, saying you have, you know, done him an injustice. So after retirement, he was, it says, a surgeon to Her Majesty the Queen, and it's on his grave. Yes, it's, it's on his grave, grave. Time, yes. And so he got that pension. And the, the wonderful thing Shibya found was that uh, when he was doing work on relapsing fever, he was describing that the, the whatever it is. What is it? It's a, it's a spiral. Kid? Spiral. It's a spiral. It is a spiral. Yeah. Um, the, the, the governor of Bombay said oh, yeah. oh, yeah. he was yeah. probably looking at one of his own yeah. flashes. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> but you see, Carter was intelligent. He didn't find them here. He couldn't find them here. He's published in London. The book is a brilliant book and you only have to look at it. To know it's brilliant work. And the BMA gave him a gold medal for it. It was a much better accolade than Surgeon to the Queen or something like that, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, to get a medical accolade is better, I think, than any of those. I would just like to share one memory of Brandon College. When I was a student, 
place to be on the OPD bending outside the iron, big iron rings were there. So we just wonder why the iron rings are there. So Dr. N.K. Mehta, surgeon, he was very Mehta. So we asked him, he knew a lot about it. So all the old doctors used to come on the horse back. So they used to tie the horses there. You know? so the rings are missing now. Makes sense. <laughs> okay. Thank you. In the OPD at JJ, yeah, yeah. there used to be a Carter laboratory. Oh, I know. The pathology in the, yes. in the in JJ. Yes. There used to be a clinical laboratory, she was saying, in JJ, which was named after Cart. But there's no evidence of that left. I don't know if it's still there. Is there is yeah. a black Yeah, black the marble Is it black still there? Yeah, I think. Oh. <laughs> I miss seeing that. I miss seeing that. Nobody showed me. I asked and asked. Is there still a picture? When I was sure it was there, I don't know. I'll take a photograph and if I get I'll send it to you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. I'll be so grateful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone at the back? I can't see you. Okay. Let's see if there's any questions. Any questions? Yeah, she's there. Yeah. Some comments, Madam, if I may make. Okay. Any comments? Uh, some, uh, few observations. Thank you, Madam, for your absolutely elegant and brilliant exposition and a very painstakingly researched uh, lecture. And uh, since my area of work is anatomy, especially from the first lecture, some of my musings, uh, not only your lectures gave deep insight into the masterly work of Dr. Carter, but they also touched upon such diverse uh, subjects like the social sciences, the psychology, geography, architecture, the visual arts, language, literature, anthropology, history, political science, economics, painting, printing, ethics of medical writing, religion, botany, and of course the English language. It was an absolute delight to listen to you, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, so now my task is to do a word of thanks. Um, again, my most heartfelt thanks to Dr. Ruth Richardson for delivering this uh, lecture. Uh, a very big thank you to Dr. Berle and his team for uh, getting us this opportunity. Uh, thanks to Ms. Nishu Goy and Kevin team for uh, helping us organize. Uh, and uh, Dean said had to leave for some meeting at the head office, but uh, he had sent his apology. Um, I thank Dr. Deshmukh for uh, his support, Dr. Pandasar of course, and Dr. Dopa Uh I also thank Mon Caterers, and uh, more caterers, I think, <laughs> decorators, and uh, cool kids caterers and million printers. Uh, I thank you all for attending in these large numbers. I uh, thank the MLT team for uh, supporting us. And uh, I would uh, request Lopa Mehta Madam to give a memento to uh, Dr. Ruth Richardson. Thank you all very much.